And now this is not necessarily kind of formatted as to one of those home workout videos where we're just gonna keep on going, you're gonna work up some sweat. What my purpose here is to allow you to maybe be introduced to or explore movements or drills to potentially carry over to surfing. Now, of course, first of all, if you wanna be a better surfer, you need to surf. And no matter how much land-based training you're going to put in, it only will go so far. If you wanna be a stronger paddler, you need to paddle more. You can do a whole bunch of Vasa trainers, swimming in the pool, rubber band kind of paddle-like movements to mimic it, but nothing comes close to actually getting out there on the waves and paddling. And I think that's probably a good, where, a good place to start is let's talk about paddling because when we are out there on a surf session, that is the majority of what you'll be. It's not standing up on a board, obviously, because for the most part, even the most proficient experts are only going to be on the wave for maybe 10, 20 seconds at best. There are some spots which I'm not going to actually mention right now, but I'm going to shut that doorbell off because it has become rather annoying. There you go, there you go. So there are spots in the world where wave rides are a lot longer, right? anywhere for a minute or two. Some are man-made, which I've had the pleasure of enjoying myself and uh, highly recommend exploring those areas. But when it comes to surfing, the majority of time, we're just laying on our board or kneeling on our board and we're paddling. And I've got to share, a few years ago, I turned 50 and one of my goals was to paddle across Monterey Bay, which by the GPS, says about 29 miles and by the the coordinates we took said about 28 so i like to think it was 29 but anyway did that a couple of times and leading up to that point i did a lot of paddle training and you can imagine uh, getting a lot of miles under your belt you develop a quite a bit of paddle strength and that has carried on even to today so i highly recommend paddling workouts to improve your ability to surf because the first one back in the lineup, if there's no one else out there, is gonna have the first opportunity to catch the next wave, or at least have the choice of which wave they wanna catch. And if you're slow on the paddle back to the lineup, getting a little bit faster may improve your ability to catch more waves, which will improve your surf ability, your surf strength, and so on. So we could easily say, go out there on the flat days when there are no waves and go ahead and surf. If you are landlocked and you're not by a coastal region where you can just simply go to the beach and go for a paddle, then you can find bodies of water like rivers, streams, and lakes and ponds to go and do the same thing. Now, flat water paddling is very easy compared to inclement weather. And therefore, I also recommend that when it's all stormed out, as long as it's not treacherous conditions, but if the wind is whipping up, and there are some white caps out there, it's actually a great day to go and do some paddle training. Just of course use safety, stay close to the shore, don't go out too far and try not to paddle by yourself. Always have a paddling partner, again, just for safety. But many of the days leading up to my Trans Bay crossing with some others, we went out and we did it in the deepest, thickest fog imaginable. And, and that was a very strong learning lesson, uh, not necessarily for surfing so much as long distance paddling, but we went out with headwinds and we went with tailwinds. We went with cross shore, offshore, onshore breezes that were more than breezes. They were close to gale force at times. And talk about working core stability while lying or trying to kneel on a board, whether it be a, a paddle board or a long board or a short board, regardless, it's a great way to build up your surf paddling strength and endurance. Now, we're not gonna go out on the water right now. We're gonna stay land-based, but I really needed to assert that if you're looking for gym exercises to carry over, they're only gonna go so far. More to the point, flexibility and joint mobility, those are the things that are actually probably going to be for most everyone here, more advantageous than simply grabbing the cables and the dumbbells and the barbells and expecting that by doing some heavy loading, that's going to carry over well. More often than not, that heavy loading 
could very well restrict movement, which will bring up compensations, which will make you work harder on the water. There needs to be a blend between strength, flexibility, mobility, as well as balance and endurance. So let's start with soft tissue. The areas surrounding the pelvis and underneath the arms and along the spine are the areas to target for the most part with foam rolling or some type, some type of soft tissue. Now I have a lot of tools at my disposal in our studio, such as your typical foam roller, the three foot foam roller, high density foam. If this is too rigid or firm for people, you've got more open cell, the white foam rollers that you can find are a little softer. They do break down quicker, so their lifespan is shorter than the high density. But if you're very sensitive, then the white foam roll may be a good place to start. We're gonna use this in just a moment. We also have a massage gun. And for roughly, oh, maybe one to $200, or you could probably find it for less than $100, this is a nice entry-level massage gun. It is USB port charged, so it can fit into your electrical outlets, but you can also, if you're on a surf trip, you can just charge it up in the van or the car, and this doesn't take up much space compared to the big rollers, and it is just a delicious tool to add to your quiver. Turning it on, there's settings in the back, and this will begin vibrating. And that head vibrating at a very high rate has different kind of settings. I could have it go faster or slower. And I can take it across my paddle muscles and just work all through there, giving yourself one of the cheapest forms of massage. We can go into any area, any crevice, and work those tight spots or those tender areas in a relatively short amount of time. And when we do that, and we bring pressure or percussion to an area, it stimulates circulation. It allows that area to potentially unlock and open up. And I should point out, yeah, at this time, if you've got questions, feel free to throw them in to the chat room and and then at the end of this, I'm gonna field those or answer those questions to the best of my ability. But we've got the massage gun, we've got the foam roller. And now if you are a tennis player, well, easy enough, or a lacrosse or anything for that matter, we've taken these two tennis balls or lacrosse balls and we've taped them up with athletic tape from top to bottom, north to south, all the way around, and then took it in between, in the equator between the balls, and wrapped tape there too. We call it the peanut for obvious reasons. Now that peanut is also a great thing to have within your surf quiver, in your surf van or car when you're taking a trip, because you can easily take this out and roll just about anywhere. The nice thing is all those paddle muscles that get shortened when you're lifting your torso, paddling on a board, all those muscles in the lower back, well, these go right down the spinal column very nicely when you're laying on your back. And they can also really open up the neck, which 10 pounds of head weight, lifting off a board, continually paddling, will often create a lot of compression and shortening on the back of that neck. So this is a wonderful massage tool to use to free up all of that kind of restriction along the spinal column. But also the interesting thing that I like to do with people just to show that one area is connected to another is I will often place this on the floor. And before a person uses it, I will just do a simple assessment such as a toe touch. What is it like? to keep their legs straight and come down and are you able to first of all touch your toes and if you're not that's okay because that just gives you information if you can go beyond your toes and get your knuckles to the ground your palms to the ground still good information it gives us an understanding of what your range of motion is like and now i'll often encourage people to do that two or three times so that their body's warmed up but no matter how many times they do it they're going to reach an end range to their ability to move so once that is established, then I'm going to simply ask them 
to roll the surface of the sole of their foot for about a minute on one foot and then a minute on the other foot. And then after that, recheck their range of motion. And more often than not, about 90% of the time, people are going to see an improvement. So if you happen to have a device like this at home while I'm talking, go ahead and try that out on your own. Do a little toe touch and then take a tennis ball or if you happen to have two taped together, it could be a, it could be a water bottle. You know, anything that's cylindrical, that is a little firm, that you can massage the soles of your feet. Do it for about a minute on each foot and then see what is that like? Did that open up your ability to move? Now, we didn't do any hamstring stretching. We didn't do any low back stretching. We didn't do any stretching at all for that matter. We simply stimulated the nerve endings in the tissue at the base of the foot, got it to open up and get some circulation. And that sent a signal to the brain, maybe to allow some of that tissue up the chain to relax and release. And there is a direct correlation between hip power, how much hip power you can have in terms of output. And when we're talking bottom turns, smacking the lip, or just getting up and crouching down the line and getting some speed, well, hip power is a big part of that. And if my hamstring muscles are restricting, that's going to minimize or at least reduce the hip power output. So anything I can do to open up the hips are going to be really greatly carried over onto a board when I'm trying to work on something down the line, whether it's maneuvers or just getting speed on the bigger waves so I don't get crushed on the inside. All right, so we've got these types of foam rollers. And I should point out at this point that I'm going to refer to our YouTube channel throughout this kind of session here because there's a tremendous amount of content on our YouTube channel. And that is just simply my name with my credentials after it. It's Rocky Snyder, comma, CSCS, which stands for Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist. So Rocky Snyder, CSCS, if you go to YouTube, and I appreciate it if you want to subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell icon once you've subscribed, it will alert you anytime we put on new content, which is actually quite regularly every week. But on that YouTube channel, I have a whole bunch of foam rolling techniques. And there's one particular video on there that you can determine what area to roll out simply by where you feel your weight in your feet. So some good insight there. But in terms of target areas, whether it be with the massage gun, with the foam roller, with any type of tools, the sport sticks, which we also have, which are easy to carry and they're relatively inexpensive. You'll find them for somewhere around $20 or so. And you can use those like grandma used to do bread dough and her rolling pin and essentially doing the same thing. So here are some target areas for foam rolling, considering that most of us, at least at this moment in time, are sitting, allowing our legs to kind of lock up at the hip joint. Certain muscles are being trained to shorten while other ones are being pulled apart because of the position you're in. And then you try and go and lay down on a board where your hips are supposed to open up and extend. But if they've been trained to be in this position, that's gonna be a hard thing to open up here and lay on a board. So then you might find yourself cranking on your lower back to offset that and kind of compensate. And it's no wonder that many surfers have low back or neck issues because those are areas often that are gonna compensate. So foam rolling target, the biggest muscle of the body, the gluteals. We wanna work on those glutes. So what you can do, whether you've got the peanut or a foam roll, is you can just have a seat on, crossing that ankle over the knee, leaning over that hip, and rolling back and forth. And how long you spend there is up to you. I generally tell people maybe about 30 seconds or so, and then go to the other side. Hitting the largest muscle of the body is probably a good idea especially because we sit on it so much and most people do not have readily available active gluteal muscles because we don't stimulate them as much. And honestly, a 10 seconds on a wave is not very long to stimulate them. So we need to do something to really kind of wake them up. The other area on the opposite side of the hip in the front of the hip are called the hip flexors. And those muscles will have a tendency to be really compressed 
And any muscle that's compressed doesn't have a lot of great circulation. So let's try and pump a little bit of life into that area, get it to open up and create circulation. So what I'll do here is I'm gonna take the corner edge of the foam roller and I'm going to line it up right in the crease of my hip toward the groin. And in that area, I'm just gonna be face down, kind of in a plank position, and I'm gonna roll back and forth. And again, maybe 30 seconds or so. Now the added benefit or byproduct of doing foam rolling is you're gonna be placing yourself in a lot of positions as if you're ready to pop up on a board. You're gonna be in a plank-like position. So not only are you working on opening up and, and rehydrating and pumping circulation into an area that's limited, you're also waking up the deeper muscles that a lot of trainers might call core, but I'm just gonna call them the deep muscles that connect point A to point B. So doing plank movements in motion is actually really nice and it carries over into surfing quite well. So the glutes, the hip flexors, and then those inner thigh muscles, we call them the adductors. And what we're gonna do there is we're gonna place the foam roll straight out in front of me. And I'm going to move slightly off to the side. I'm going to bring one leg out to the side. And I'm just going to roll the inside of that thigh. And I'm gonna go from the inside portion of my knee joint all the way into the crease of my hip, right into the groin. Those are some simple ones around the hips. And we've got 57 muscles that cross the pelvis, almost like bicycle spokes. Most of them go down into the legs, so that's why we're focusing there. Some of them, however, go up to the upper body, such as the lat muscle, the biggest muscle of the upper body. And it's the muscle that connects the arm to the mid, low back area, as well as the back of the pelvis. It's the only muscle attaching the arm to the lower back and to the hips. So in that regard, in terms of paddling and being able to get a full reach so that you can have efficient stroke, well, it's really essential that we open up those lats. So we can lay back on it as if you're in a lazy boy, reclined back and got the remote control in hand, and you can simply go along the spine, which will feel really good for most people, However, I'm also going to lean slightly over to one side and go along the edge of my shoulder blade from the armpit to the bottom of my shoulder blade. Now, it's very important that you don't go further down into the rib cage because the ribs were not meant to handle such pressure like that, almost like resting on top of a fence pole or something. It does not feel good and it could be injurious. So you're only going to roll out from basically the back of your arm here. You could even go all the way up to the elbow itself. And you're going to roll down to right about here. And those muscles will really help your ability to open up and allow the arm to reach freely so that I can grab as much water with every stroke possible. Most of us don't spend time tr climbing trees or jungle gyms like we did when we were a kid. Very rarely do our arms go up overhead for prolonged periods of time. So this tissue here becomes shortened when we're in the steer, when we're driving, when we're at the keyboard, the dinner table, reading a book, whatever, on our phones, all that tissue gets locked down. So all the areas that we're hoping to open up when we surf are the same areas that go on lockdown when we're not surfing. Okay. The other areas that I didn't mention would be the, the lower leg and the calf. So you can take that sports stick, you can sit back and put the roller on it. There's a whole bunch of ways to roll out the calf. You can check the YouTube channel. <coughs> Mobility. Let's work on those hips. Now that you've done a little bit of foam rolling, massage, you've given a little CPR with that foam roll pressure. Let's see if you can open up the hips. And we'll start in a seated position with one foot bent back behind me and the other foot, the sole of it coming right up to the front of my thigh. And from here, I can support myself with both hands and I keep my feet where they are, but I'm gonna lift my knees up 
And then I'm going to rotate those knees over to the other side. And then go back and forth. So this rotational motion, bringing one knee forward and in, while the other one goes out and away, is a nice way to start to work on getting some rotation through those hips. The next phase or progression might be to not use your hands. And can you sit upright and wake up the muscles that keep you in this nice vertical position while your legs are there? So now we're working on opening up the hips while stimulating the muscles that go down your vertical column. And then can you go over to the other side and sit upright and do the same? Keeping your feet down on the ground and rotating around. This is a nice one you could do on the beach when you're watching the lineup, when you're trying to decide where's the channel, where am I gonna paddle out? Get, get a sense of where the surfers are taking off. You know, it's just a nice way to kind of get yourself familiar with a new surf spot and warm up at the same time. The other one you could do while lying on the sand to open up those hips would be to simply lie on your back, feet are flat, crossing one ankle over the opposite knee, and if possible, just lift up into this position without the use of your hands, but just using the muscles surrounding your hips and midsection to maintain this position. Now, most people are gonna experience a stretch on the back side of the hip of that leg that's crossed. That's the point for more or less, but it's also to wake up the other muscles to create a better balance of tension in the hips. Once you've done this for about 30 seconds, then keep that same leg position, but rotate over to the ground. And then with this knee, push it away so it points up toward the ceiling. And then you could do the same thing on the opposite side. Now, most of these movements are found on the YouTube channel, so you can kind of peruse through and look for them. We call that the hip lift or cross knee lift and the crossover twist. Both those movements combined pack a very powerful punch in restoring better balance to the muscles surrounding your pelvis, which is what your spine sits upon. And if the hips are in their right position, that allows the knees and the ankles to be in their proper position, as well as the spine and the shoulders. When the pelvis becomes askewed and imbalanced and tilts or turns or twists, well, that's going to play down the chain through the knees into the feet, as well as up the chain. Most of us are either regular foot surfers or goofy foot. Very few of us prefer the switch stanch approach where you're going to go out and and pop up with your left leg forward one wave and then the right leg forward the next, chances are that really doesn't happen. So for my particular case, I'm goofy foot. And even as I'm kneeling here, you can see I'm in a goofy foot kneeling position. Left leg is under me, right leg is forward. It's something that's become subconscious in terms of patterning. When I step forward, I almost always step forward with my right leg, just like regular surfers would normally step forward with their left leg. These patterns become ingrained over time and they can actually pull us out of alignment. So that movement on the floor where you just saw, you're most likely gonna feel very different from one side to the other. And the side that you felt the most intensity is most likely the one you wanna focus on more to bring your body back into a balanced state so that you have the freedom to move evenly to the left or to the right. Because if I'm already rotated left, I can only rotate left so much more. And I might be unable to rotate right well because I'm not familiar with that. However, if I bring myself to a more true balanced position, the ability to travel evenly from side to side is much greater. And that means I'm gonna have a much, much more power and balance and stability at my disposal. So those two movements on the floor, I can't impress enough the significance of doing those on a regular basis. You might find that your knee pain goes away or your lower back pain goes away or oddly enough, your shoulder stops bothering you simply because you've balanced out the pelvis. Now, other things we can do for mobility for the upper body would be uh, arm action, 
One of the easiest ones, and I'm just going to stay kneeling because that takes my legs out of the equation and focuses a lot more attention on the upper area, is called elbow touches, where I take my knuckles and I place them against my temples. And in this position, I'm going to try and draw my elbows all the way together and all the way back. And this kind of hinge-like motion for the shoulders allows the scapula or shoulder blade to become unlocked or unpasted from the rib cage because it's meant to glide across the rib cage and not be stuck to it. But the more we get on our cell phones, behind the steering wheel, keyboard, the more that just becomes locked in place. And then if those aren't gliding, that greatly affects the ability of my shoulder to function. And then the next thing you know, my shoulders start bothering me because the mechanics of my movement have been compromised. So simply taking your knuckles on your temples, bringing your elbows together and apart. Now, as some of you demonstrate this, I see that the body is gently moving forward and backwards to get out of the way for the elbows to touch. If that's your situation, try laying or standing against the wall and having your head and your tailbone touching the wall so that you can't do that. And that will make this much more focused and concentrated. And you'll find that it perhaps is a completely different situation. It may be that you can't even touch your elbows yet because your body is forced to stay in good alignment. So that's one way of opening up the shoulders, some simple elbow touches. But the arms are very complex in their ability to move. They swing forward and back. They can swing out and away or toward the body. And they can also internally and externally rotate. And when we're talking about paddling, we're constantly reaching up, drawing internal rotation. When the arm comes out, we have to externally rotate it, get that elbow up, reach forward and get another stroke. So if the shoulders are nice and fluid, then our efficiency in paddling is going to be much better and our ability to push off the board is going to be equally so. So let's explore arm motion. With your arms potentially out by your side at shoulder height, if that's too much for some of you, if you already have shoulder pain, you can simply drop them, drop them down by your side. But with the palms face up, you're going to focus mainly on the elbow or the crease of the elbow, not so much your hand, I'd like you to turn the crease of that elbow inward and back behind you. And then reverse direction while the other arm pro provides that same motion. If you can do this and keep your head still, you'll find that when you internally rotate one arm as it rotates down and around behind you, that sends the shoulder forward and upward. You get a sense of that. And then when you unwind it, the shoulder drops down and back. Do you have those simple joint mechanics occurring? Or do you find that you're only rotating your wrists and your shoulder's not doing a blessed thing? Or you're rotating through the forearm and still the shoulder's not moving. Can you unlock that action? Can you keep the head, for the most part, in one place? And what does that feel like? I can do the same kind of action, but reach forward with one hand with the palm up while the arm that's going back behind me is turning the palm inward and away. And then same thing here, palm up, reaching forward, palm turning in and away behind me. And can I keep my head in one place? Or do I feel myself reaching and trying to do this? I'm just looking to try and maintain this nice alignment of my head over my spine. And can I rotate around that balance point? Because if you watch any long border or short border, you'll find that they're constantly having their knees bent. And when they're making moves, their head stays over their hips. And whether or not they're trying to get power or speed down the line or walk out to the nose, come on back for something else, their head is almost always staying right over their hips. So can we get these movements to occur while that head stays over the hips? So those are called cogs, like cog wheels. 
because the arms are moving in opposition, just like cog wheels in a wristwatch. And there are a whole bunch of cog, arm cog videos on the YouTube channel in different positions and different fashions. So these actions are very reminiscent of paddling. The only time that we use both arms to try and do the same thing at the same time is when we pop up off a board. It's the only time. As soon as you're up, one arm's going forward, one arm's going back. They may switch, they may spin in the same direction, but one's spinning outward while the other one spins toward the body. So you can see that all these arm movements are all about opposition. And it's the lengthening of the muscle tissue to rebound and go across to the other side. If my arms went in the same direction at the same time, they would kind of almost negate themselves or no muscle action would actually occur. There'd be no lengthening and shortening, no opposition. And therefore I couldn't produce much force that way. I'd have to get it somewhere else. So those are some simple mobility drills. The other thing that I, I recommend, and if you have them at home, would be these little beauties. These are called Indian clubs. And I do have a playlist of Indian clubs. And I had a previous meetup all about an Indian club workshop. These are all about creating space in the shoulder joints through centrifugal force. These clubs, they look like I'm gonna do some juggling, but I'm not. But they're called Indian clubs and they're about 5,000 years old. These particular ones are about 100 years old, but they are all about pulling and distracting and creating space on the shoulder. So I can simply do some arm circles, but then it gets a bit more fancy and you can do a whole bunch of patterns with them and they work on really opening up the shoulders, which will relax the neck, which will just unlock the mid back. It will get the shoulder blades to move freely across the rib cage and a whole bunch more. So, and, and they're great for upper body endurance and they're just exploring a whole bunch of movements behind the body, in front of the body, in different positions. And it's just a, a really nice complement to opening up all your paddle muscles. Now, if you were to go online, you could find these for probably about $50 for a pair of brand new, but I got all mine through eBay because a lot of people don't know what they are and they call them juggling pins or bowling pins. And if you can score a couple for like maybe 15 to $20 each, so 30 to $40 a pair, it's a pretty good find. And I would recommend if you're gonna use the juggling pins, maybe one pound, potentially a pound and a half, at the most two pounds. It doesn't sound like much, but when you start swinging things around away from your body, it adds up. And these juggling pins are wonderful. If you happen to be in the Santa Cruz area, I do have a couple of pair that are extra and I'm, I'm willing to sell them for about 40 bucks or so. If you wanna just let me know, um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, Cause I do have quite a few. I, I like collecting antiques, I guess. Uh, yeah, just like my wife does me, huh? All right, so moving on, let's talk about strength. Lower body strength. There's only a 10 second wave ride, but yet when we look at a lot of surf conditioning, there's, there's a lot of leg exercises, um, which is fine, we'll, we'll do some. I, I also think that upper body endurance and strength is really critical and, and lower body is more about flexibility and balance. But lower body action. If you're a long boarder and like myself, like to do a drop knee turn, then a back lunge is a wonderful kind of thing to do. Or a back lunge and going off to the side, almost like you're doing a curtsy. So you might call this a curtsy lunge. And this is where you're stepping back and slightly away. The thing that I pay attention to is the forward knee. Because in this position, not only am I pushing off the tail of my board, but I'm getting a lot of power off of my forward hip in that glute. And as long as my knee stays above my foot, when I come down here, then I'm loading into that muscle. However, a lot of people with restriction in that area, when they come out, their knee will glide away and off the foot. And so then we're not really utilizing that so much as we're using other muscles, others that we may not want to use. So as you come down into that back lunge or curtsy lunge, you're keeping that knee directly over the foot. And of course, switching over to the other side, is a good idea just so you can assess what side felt better, what side needs more work. Do I wanna do a little bit more on one side compared to the other? 
Now, rather than stepping behind you in that action, we could step forward. So if I were standing on a clock face with 12 in front of me, I may take my left leg and come across to say one o'clock. And I can drop down in this position, kind of like getting down, grabbing the rail, getting into that tuck position through the barrel, and then coming back out. Same thing over here, I'll go over to maybe 10 or 11 o'clock with my right leg, coming on down, and then driving on back. If we can get ourselves into surf stances and start to work movement while in that surf stance, that is so much more surf specific than simply doing, oh, deadlifts or squats or step ups or things like that. Actually put yourself in a position that you find yourself on the board and then feed movement through it. That's huge because that's going to train your nervous system what to do while you're in that position, even if it's only for a few seconds you'll give yourself more understanding of what to do and what not to do. And it'll actually reduce your likelihood of injury too. Now, we could work on upper body and of course push-ups, and we used to call them squat thrusts in New England growing up, but they've now been called burpees and maybe that's the West Coast term. But I had a conversation with a colleague of mine who actually is in New England and a very prominent strength coach used to be for the NHL and so on. And he made this claim that burpees are the worst exercise in the world and nobody should ever do them. And I almost agreed with him, except when it comes to the surf community. So the 35 million surfers in the world, this is one exercise that actually pertains to you. This is where you're laying down, imagine that you're on the board and you're gonna pop up. Now you can come all the way up to a standing posture However, I don't actually recommend that. I recommend just coming into your surf stance and then go back down from there, pop up. You can come up a little bit, but then drop down into your surf stance. Now don't just do a regular foot, go ahead and try a goofy foot and start to open up the ability to move in more than one direction. So the burpees, now push-ups. When it comes to push-ups, think about this. You're paddling for a wave. And let's say it's a pretty big day and you're more concerned with catching the wave and getting away from the curl because this is one of the biggest waves you've caught in a while and you just want to get screaming down the line. Are you thinking about where your hands are placed? Not a chance. No one's actually going to say, okay, I need to position my hands at shoulder width apart, just like I'm practicing my push-ups in the gym. And the reason why I bring this up is because we can come up with a whole bunch of different hand positions in order to do the push-up. And the beautiful thing there is, is the body will adapt to specific adaptations, meaning that if all I'm doing are push-ups over and over again with hands parallel, nice and symmetrical, then I will be very good at that. But it may not carry over to when my hands are like this or like this, or I've got one and oh, my hand slipped because there wasn't enough wax on the board and now my hand's here. Can you create different hand positions while doing a push-up? And if we really add them up, there's 27 different hand positions to choose from. We can be a, a neutral shoulder width apart or narrower or wider. We can have the hands side by side, or we can have one higher or the other higher. We can have the hands facing straight ahead or turned outward or inward. And then we can combine those, like having one underneath me while the other one's wide, this hand's turned in, that hand's turned out. And when you start adding up those variations, it comes to 27. So when doing a push-up, I might have one hand in front of me or over here or a number of different places. So the push-up can be very nice. Doing it on the floor, if you're not, your strength levels aren't up to that yet, yes, you can do them on your knees, but you can also position your hands higher off the floor. So you're still doing it on your toes. It's just angled up higher. And of course, doing it against the wall is gonna be probably the most easy way of doing a push-up. And then the lower those hands get, maybe on a chair or a bench or a footstool, the more challenging it's going to be. So if this is where you need strength, then do it in a way that you're successful. And always leave a, like an extra repetition in your set. Try not to blast it to the nth degree. Just feed a little bit of that demand into your body. Now, I was talking about getting into a split stance or a surfer stance. And let's just assume that these, these Indian clubs may be dumbbells. So if, you're, if you have dumbbells at home, I'm gonna get myself into 
kind of my surf stance. Maybe I'll get down a little bit lower. Gonna keep my head more or less over my hips so I can be moving. And then in this position, I can start to feed movement with dumbbells anywhere I choose to. I can just go back and forth here. I can reach forward. I can reach out to one side or the other, across the body, behind the body, up and behind the body. The purpose of doing this movement is to one, create better stability through my legs while my body up above is moving in all sorts of directions. Feeding my nervous system information and stimuli as to what it needs to do as I'm crouched and my body is moving in various ways. So in regards to surf training and conditioning, placing yourself in surf specific postures, whether it's laying down prone or in a squatted split stance, like you're on the board, are really great environments to feed strength and information through your whole frame. Now, when it comes to trunk training, like midsection, connecting the upper body to the lower body, that's a huge component. Because if I'm generating force through my hips, down to the board, up through my skull, I really want that force to flow as fluid as the wave that I'm riding. But if I have areas that don't know how to transfer force, and that it's just simply going from one area and trying to get to another area without cleanly moving through my body, that's going to create compensation and a higher likelihood of injury. So when it comes to trunks, we can use a resistance band anchored at whatever height you want because variety is the spice of life. I can get myself into that surf stance and I can just start working a little bit of motion side to side. I can use one hand, I can use the other hand, I can use both hands. I can go high, I can go low. Of course, switching to stances, see what that's like. Changing from one side to the other. Can I pivot around? Any of those movements are going to be very specific to getting that body to feel what it's like to move back and forth. I can also put that rubber band around my knee and get down here. So now I'm feeding resistance into my legs that way. I can wrap the rubber band so it pulls me there and now I've got to fight moving away or I can wrap the rubber band over that side so I've got to pull away in the opposite direction. All of those are going to start to wake up the muscles that keep you in those places. So there's strength. We've dealt with mobility, foam rolling. So now it's time for a little bit of balance. So with balance, I mentioned earlier that we can do what we call neuro drills, where we're dealing with the neurological system. Where you get the majority of your balance, I would say 90% of your balance comes through your visual system. And then your vestibular system, and then all the nerve endings that are throughout your body that tell you where you are in space. But the high majority of information that tells you where you are in space and how to balance goes through the eyes. That means that if you've got any kind of eye issues uh, and you use corrective lenses or whatnot, uh, that actually affects your balance. Not that corrective lenses affect, affect your balance necessarily, it's not what I'm trying to say, is that any deficiency or any weakness in the visual information getting to the brain may actually affect your balance. So we're gonna do a little bit of a, a visual drill here and you can play along with me. What I'm gonna have you do is we're going to first assess your ability to balance on one leg. So standing up with or without shoes on, I would encourage you to simply come on up and see what it's like to balance on one leg. And after say maybe 15 seconds or so, switch over to the other leg and see what the quality of balance is like on the opposite foot. And do that for about 15 seconds each. Then compare the two. One of them was more compromised than the other. Maybe to a great degree or maybe to a very minute degree. 
but chances are there was one that was a little bit more challenging. All right, that is the side that we are going to use to assess and reassess the next couple of drills to see if that improved or if it impaired your balance. So what we're gonna have you do is you're simply going to stand with both feet on the ground in a comfortable standing stance. You're going to take your arm at about arm length, arm reach, and you're gonna have your thumb up so you can stare at the tip of your thumb. And all you're simply gonna do is try to keep your head still. And with your thumb right in front of you, you're going to be looking up at the thumb and staring and holding for about five seconds. And then check your balance after that with arms by your side and eyes open. Check your single leg balance on the challenge side. If that improved your balance, how wonderful is that? You've just found a very simple neuro drill to increase your ability to balance. And we're not talking muscular strength or flexibility. We're actually talking your brain signal to your body to provide better balance. Now, if you found that looking up with your head still and holding that gaze up there actually compromised your balance, well, maybe that's a little bit too much stimuli. There's something there. We don't have time to go into it right now, but we might want to avoid bringing the eyes up. Let's do this now. We went eyes up with both feet on the ground, keeping your head level, drop the thumb down below nose level and stare at it about five to 10 seconds. And then with your arms by your side, check your balance once more. Now, you may find that you began to wobble a little bit. You didn't lose your balance, but maybe it wasn't as firmly in place or maybe it improved. Either way, now you're getting a sense of, do I take my eyes up or down to improve my balance? And can I do that simply before I paddle out? Yes. Could I do that while I'm sitting out on my board and waiting for the next set to come through? Yes. Okay, we went up and down. Let's go left and right. Feet underneath you, both standing on the ground, head looking straight ahead, your thumb out, and you're going to take it over to one side and then stare at it without turning your head. What you might find is, is that it's actually difficult and your eyes start blinking. Go ahead and relax and then recheck your balance. And then get a sense of what it's like to take your eyes to the opposite side, head straight ahead, do not turn your head, just simply bring your, arm, your, your thumb out to one side so that both eyes can see it. And then drop it back down and check. Now, for some of you, I can see that there's one side that really responded well, and one side, you were like a drunken sailor ready to just go flying into the lamppost. So that's great information for you. And it makes you scratch your head like, how, why is that happening? Well, we can go into that another time, but really what it's also showing you is that I can feed better balance into my frame just by getting my brain to get stimulated in a better way. And that may be bringing my eyes to the left and maybe bring them down. I could do diagonals up and to the right, down and to the left, wherever that may be. But those are some simple ones. Now we also have the vestibular system in the inner ear. So let's just briefly do a drill about that. We're gonna do the same four movements, up, down, left, and right. But this time, what you'll be doing is staring straight ahead at some object across from you, whether it's the computer screen or something behind it on the wall. Your feet are underneath you, and we're gonna go up first. So keeping your eyes locked on something, you're just gonna tilt your head up quickly and hold. And then slowly bring it back down a level and check your single leg balance. Then after that, looking straight ahead, you're going to quickly drop your head and hold for a few seconds, and then slowly bring it back up and recheck your balance once more. Now for me, I can instantly feel that going down 
compromise my balance, but going up was actually quite beneficial. Now let's go left and right. So what you're going to do here is you're going to turn your head quickly to the left, but keep your eyes face forward, hold, and then slowly bring it back around. Check your balance. And then once again, both feet underneath you, staring straight ahead, turn your head quickly to the right, keeping focus straight ahead and then return and then reassess the balance there. And chances are you're going, ah, I didn't feel much on some of these, but maybe there's some that you felt like, oh, wow, I actually felt like I had better balance. And then there's others you're going to go, wow, I, I instantly felt wobbly. Now, if you feel a little uh, queasy in the tummy, what you can simply do is just keep your head still, have your eyes look up, hold for a few seconds, look down, look to the left, look to the right. That should actually settle your stomach down because moving your head quickly can irritate a nerve that goes down into your tummy sometimes. Okay. The other things I want to bring up are other things that are kind of accessories like skateboarding. If you feel comfortable enough to go out and do some skateboarding, not at the skate park, but just uh, on, your, on your sidewalk or wherever, skating is a wonderful way to transfer surf motion on land. Very similar. So skateboarding can be wonderful. At all ages, I don't wanna hear that, oh, I'm 85, I shouldn't be skateboarding because I'll show you videos of 85 year olds getting out there on their boards. And then the other thing that is very hard to find, but we have one here, it's called a core trainer. And the Reebok company came out with it many years ago. It's this gigantic kind of platform here, the core trainer. It's got rubber gaskets under it. So for a lot of the surfers that come in here, it can, it's kind of a balance board, but it's a very stiff one. However, it does rotate. So we can start to work on that motion back and forth. So those are some simple samples of accessory motions that you can do to enhance your surfing. But the number one thing is paddle, 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 if you wanna be a better paddler. 